y'all dealing with the king. If you want to come and get it, let the outlaw get you out your seats. You want sports talk politics? He don't give a shit. Everyone can say speak, follow it. About to issue y'all a master class. You want to pass? Come slinging the new podcast, eat candy ass. Robert Todd's bitch, get information. It's your boy, John Roker. Welcome to the Outlaw Nation. All right, welcome everybody to this week's edition of the Outlaw Nation. I am John Roca, aka the Outlaw. You guys know me from the Schmodown and various other things on Collider. Thanks for downloading the episode and listening. Uh, thanks everybody for listening last week. The great comments on Mark Andreco and the stuff he had to say about his life and how he got in comic writing and Kevin Spacey and all that. Like you guys have given him, uh, he had a really rough week last week, so all your comments were very well received by him. Uh, I saw him yesterday in passing, and he told me so. So I just want to relay that to you guys in case he doesn't get a chance to say it on Twitter. Uh, he wanted to thank you all so much. So, But this week, um, I, uh, I've i been waiting to get this person on the show for quite some time. And schedule, she's very busy. She does a lot of things. Uh, so I was very happy that we were able to find some time to bring her on this week. And most of you know her if you watch Collider and you watch Nerdist and uh, various other outlets. Um uh, it's Clark Wolf. Hello. <laughs> and of course, you've seen her in the Schmodown as well as part uh, as her own competitor and also as part of Wolves of Steel. So, Clark, welcome to Outlaw Nation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, I wanted to bring you on because I, I, I and we've had a, a a fun time, like just talking about issues and talking about geek stuff, nerd stuff. Like you, you've been, you're very. Uh, uh, vocal about the things that you like and don't like and you're very into the nerd and the geek stuff and I guess I want to start from the I don't want to necessarily do a don't be a beard or repeat again but I do want to find out a little more about like where did you grow up where did you start out where did you grow up uh, the kind of things that like, were you born like all that kind sure of stuff. um so I was born in Atlanta Georgia okay and uh I grew up there and well, I grew up in a suburb right outside of Atlanta called Alpharetta okay um and then as soon as uh, I finished high school my parents moved into the city okay and uh and I did my first year of college in New York and then didn't love New York so came back to Atlanta um with the intention of sort of enrolling in school mm-hmm. um to keep up and not fall behind but like to transfer and to go somewhere else okay. and ultimately I ended up staying at Georgia State which is a university in downtown Atlanta right. and um, at the time they had this really I don't know if they still do it this way but they had this really great um, film program where essentially you could build your own program mm-hmm. just as long as you like hit certain requirements right. um, and I was also going to school on a scholarship which was amazing so uh, so yeah so I finished college in Atlanta and then I moved to Los Angeles well, so how long have you been out here I have been out here for uh, a little over nine years. Wow. And what did you study at Georgia State Film? Like, what were you doing, analysis, or were you going to be a director? Were you going to be an actor, writer, producer? Yeah, I was more um, focusing on theory. I loved oh, okay. analysis, and I loved theory. And okay. what was so great about our program was, you know, we took, I took a screenwriting class, I took media classes, mm-hmm. I took theory classes, I took more practical classes. and um, but, but really, as long as you, like I said, you know, you hit those requirements, Mm -hmm. the teachers were pretty flexible and they would let you sort of uh, you know, build your own curriculums and programs. I mean, of course, there was right. a guidance. Like, I took a course in Hitchcock, or I took a, right. you know, et cetera, et cetera. But um, so I was able to sort of manufacture my degree in like um, uh, film theory and analysis, uh, genre theory. Mm-hmm. So horror, political commentary and horror and sci fi wow. was the stuff that I always en- enjoyed um, sort of like shoehorning into my, my requirements. Right. And then my minor was in women's studies. And so that also sort of plays into. Um, the political commentary and horror and sci-fi. Interesting. So political, like, this is something like, so let's go a little bit back further mm-hmm. then in your life. But when did you um, kind of sense for yourself that you were becoming, you had like a political point of view on the world? Because yeah. I'm sure there probably, you were around people who didn't. Mm-hmm. And you were like, well, why am I so different? Like, what, 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 did, you, what, did, what got you into it? No, that's a really good question because I grew up in sort of like the Orange County of Atlanta. Gotcha. So, you know, it's a, it's suburban and it's just lots of, it's lots of families from all over. Right. Um, but it's mostly like a white upper middle class neighborhood mm-hmm. um, and um, my parents were always very politically active my dad's a criminal defense attorney oh, gotcha. and my mom is has always been very politically involved okay. um, and so I grew up being very aware mm-hmm. of local politics um, nationwide politics my mom 
always has the news on. Right. Always. Right. Um, you, you know, she she usually has a TV on, but instead of, and not that there's anything wrong with having sitcoms or whatever. Sure, on, sure, sure. But she always has some form of news on the TV. Mm-hmm. And she reads the paper every day, and my dad is the same. Um, so that was always something that I was very aware of, um, even as a little kid, right. just by osmosis. Okay. Um, and by the way, that news extended into entertainment news, too, because right. she would watch the local news, and then she would watch the uh, national nightly news, and then she would watch Entertainment Tonight. So it's like <laughs> she was like interested in all the news. Right. Um, and so uh, so when I, when I got into high school, because um, I always loved, you know, scary movies, but mm-hmm. I was a little sc- – I was too scared of them. Right. Like I really f- was impacted by them. Yeah, yeah. And so um, – but when I got into high school, I started to realize that film is um, – a conversation and mm-hmm. it has something to say a lot of times whether it's comedy or horror or drama or whatever the case may be yeah. or western um there's a point of view a lot of times right. not all the times right, right. but um but there it usually has something to say and so as i got older i started unpacking and realizing oh horror and science fiction really usually are talking about whatever a culture is afraid of at yeah. the time yeah. um and so in college that was when i was able to finagle that in to like right. really diving a little deeper, yeah. um, which was again amazing about Georgia State was that these professors were so into that. Right. Um, uh, that's when I started really getting into analysis and theory. Now, what about uh, with film? Mm-hmm. The, what is was, is there one touchstone film that you come back to that really kind of sparked, uh, woke you up to the idea of what film can do, the power of film, or the message within a film, what it can do for you like how it affected you I was really um, emotionally invested in The Wizard of Oz since I was very young okay Um, you know I grew up watching movies Mm -hmm. Um, I grew up on entertainment and pop culture I loved television I loved film but so when I was a kid you know I was watching and when I say kid I mean three four five years old (laughs) in addition to watching you know the more traditional things like The Wizard of Oz I was watching Back to the Future and I was watching Tim Burton's Batman and I was watching Beatles juice and I was like really into Star Wars and I was right. really into um, Richard Donner Superman was another big one that I grew up on so right. like I've, I've been my, my dad loves movies okay. and so um, and not necessarily in a way of like he knows every little thing about them or he's right. not like a guy who goes to conventions but he loves movies and music and entertainment and so he and I grew up watching movies together oh, I grew great. up watching movies with my dad so it seems like you got a lot of guidance uh, from your mom and your dad in into your interests in this, it, like they form. Did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, okay. I do. I have a brother. I have a younger brother. He's uh-huh. three years younger than me. Although he and I are not very close. Okay. Um, and we don't really talk regularly. Okay. Um, but, I have that uh, with one of my brothers. Yeah. So I get that. I yeah. think a lot of people, you know, it's. I find that it's either like one or the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People are best friends with their siblings, yes. or they're just like, it's not a good thing. So <laughs> only on holidays. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, um, so yes, I do have a younger brother, but I. I, okay. um, I'm not, we're not, we've never been close and we're not close now. Okay. So different interests, different yeah. points of view, that yeah. kind of thing. Okay. How, uh, like, uh, so then when you came to LA, mm-hmm. what were you focused on? Like, what did you start out doing? Like, did you, were you like working like a, a barista? Were you doing a temp work? Like what was, how was your transition to LA? Yeah, it was interesting because, so speaking of siblings, I have a person in my life, his name is Jason, and mm-hmm. he is like a brother to me. Gotcha. Uh, we grew up together. I've known him. So oh, he's a little okay. older than me. Our parents were friends for years. And then when I got into high school, he and I became very close. Gotcha. Um, but, but he was a little older than me and he always had his own interests. So like we right. didn't really play or get to know each other that much when we were kids, right. kids. But once we were in high school, we came, we became very close and we're still close to this day. Yeah. Um, um, and because he was a little older than me and because he is essentially a brother to me or like family to me, he came to L.A. a little early, okay. earlier than me. So um, all throughout my senior year of college, I was going back and forth between Atlanta and Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And I was sort of like getting the lay of the land because I had no intention of coming here. Um, wow. I had it was my spring break, my college, my senior year of college. Mm-hmm. And Jason was out here and I was like, well, I go back to New York every spring break, but to see friends there. But maybe this time I'll go visit Jason. Yeah. And I was super nervous because I thought L.A. was like entourage. And, <laughs> and that was that was everywhere, and everyone. And I was really, really nervous. And then I got I got here and I realized, no, yeah. it's regular people and they live in the city. And, and I, I called my parents by the end of the first day. And yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm moving this. Oh, you knew? I knew. Wow. I knew really fast. Yeah. Wow. 
Because I knew also that New York was not for me. Yeah. I knew that really fast, but I didn't want to accept it. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to admit it. And it took my mom actually saying to me, like, you yeah. are. She, I will never forget, actually, because my mom is not like a warm and fuzzy mom. Okay. Um, but I do remember, and I'll never forget her saying this. It was like towards the end of my freshman year of college when I was living in Manhattan. And mm-hmm. she was like, you are disappearing. You don't need to be there anymore. Wow. And and she's like, it's there's nothing wrong with not wanting to live there anymore. Right, it's, right. It's okay. And and of course, like all my friends had gone to Georgia or Auburn or mm-hmm. all these places and they right. were loving it. And I was like, Why don't I like it? <laughs> it's like New York City is very different. Yeah. Um, so um when I first came out here, I was so as a as a college student, I was a professional theater actor in Atlanta. Gotcha. Um, and so I was doing a lot of work. Were you equity? Uh, no, I okay. was not. Okay. I was not. I was doing a... Um, so there's this place called Agatha's in Atlanta. Okay. And it's a um, it's a murder mystery place. Uh, oh, but wow. it's it's just this institution. It's yeah. been going for 30 years. And it's mm-hmm. comedy. And it's very interactive. Right. The audience gets to do stuff. Um, but we get to play ridiculous characters. And at the time, I was making really good money. <laughs> like, I mean, if I had that money coming in now, I'd probably be, and free dinners, I'd be like, sign me up, this is great. Um, but, uh, so, I was, I was doing a lot of theater when yeah. I was in Atlanta and I, and I really liked doing that. Um, keep in mind, we think of, if you know anything about the industry now, that Hollywood has moved to Atlanta. Right. But it was not like that. You right. You know, when I was living there in college, yep. it was almost still like when I moved to Los Angeles, everything moved <laughs> back to Atlanta. <laughs> so I was like, great. Uh, but that being said, when I moved out here, I um, obviously wanted to continue pursuing, be, uh, you know, scripted and mm-hmm. and. and this is another thing that it kind of sounds crazy, but it's true. At the time, YouTube was in the beginnings. Yes. And at the time, the mindset was very much like, no, you're a host or you're a writer right. or you're this, but you don't, people were not doing a million different things. Yeah. And, and so now, now it's like, of course, why wouldn't George Clooney do a coffee commercials? Yeah. And, and why wouldn't, you know, Joel McHale be a, a, a legitimate actor yeah. on in film and television he's a comedian it's like that i'm sure there were examples there are a handful of examples of people who were doing it but right. it was not the norm mm-hmm. it was absolutely not the norm yeah. um and so I, I was kind of like, okay, so I started interning at a management company and that company mostly repped writers and gotcha. directors. Okay. Um, and you know, those writers were like, Chris Morgan was a writer that was oh, wow. there. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, and it's a lot of comedy guys, Rob McKittrick who wrote and directed waiting with Ryan Reynolds and Anna right. Ferris and like a lot of comedy, a lot of, um, you know, really cool stuff that these guys were doing and they were all awesome. So I was interning there. I was working as a hostess in a Beverly Hills restaurant, mm-hmm. but what's amazing about that too, keep it mine i moved out here in the summer of 2008 the economy had literally crashed so everyone was trying to get restaurant jobs Mm -hmm. and people were scrambling so even if you're the 20 something fresh off the boat like trying to make your way even those jobs you were really hard to get and then in the you know early to um early months and the spring of 2009 writer strike yep so not only do you have the economy bottoming and banks weren't lending in yeah. order to make movies, yeah. then the writers strike. Yep. So nothing is in production and there's this influx of reality television. Yeah. And it was like the industry was changing mm-hmm. and I was here with no resources and no contacts and yeah. no, you know, nobody gives a shit what you've done before you get here. Right. And so it was like, nobody cared that I was working steadily as a theater actor <laughs> somewhere <laughs> else. Like nobody cared about that. So that was sort of the beginnings. Right. Um, and, but I was, I was writing for myself, like more commentary or like um, responses to, um, you know, things I'd read in magazines or whatever. And so I had writing samples and I was able to send those out for internships or whatever. Um, But I was also, you know, trying to, gosh, I mean, trying to find theater companies to work with, Mm -hmm. trying to like do non-union film shoots, like whatever I could. But it was it was a really interesting first couple of years. No, you're right. Um, I came in 2000, mm-hmm. and so I saw it change. Yeah. And, and the, the apartment you're sitting in now recording this, I pay 1200 for this thing. It's a one-bedroom with a parking space. And the reason is because 
I moved into this when the economy crashed. Uh-huh. They had six units here that were available, wow. and I talked them down from 14 to 11. And it was because the economy crashed and the writer's strike and all this kind of jazz. So I hold on to this apartment with like white knuckles. And you're smart to do that too. (laughs) Because it's a spacious place. But like I understand what the economy was Mm -hmm. and you you got in at the time. And so, so much stuff was changing that it was really hard for those of us who were still trying to make it as actors like to hold on to the runaway train because it was on numerous – it kept jumping tracks. Nobody knew what they were doing. Yeah, nobody knew what they were doing. And when reality TV came in and exploded – Everybody was super afraid across the industry that we were going to be phased out as actors, writers, directors, mm-hmm. producers, and it was all just going to be reality TV. On because if people remember who are listening, there was a boom of reality mm-hmm. television, and that's why they were able to screw the writers. Before over. then, it was Survivor. Yeah, it was one like, thing. Like seriously, right. like I know that sounds really crazy yeah. to think of, yeah. and and real world. Uh, it yes, was real world and real Survivor. world and Survivor. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then it became. All these other things because they had to fill yeah. time in in their schedules, and so they put these in production. They're like, we don't even need writers for this, or so we'll get non union writers yeah. who will write just fake drama on these reality mm-hmm. shows. Which I hate to break to all of you, it's all fake it's drama, all fake, yeah, yeah uh, to reality. So yeah, so we're trying to hold us. So I understand that absolutely, but but you were being industrious. You were still writing stuff out, sending stuff out, trying to trying to get like what was your ultimate like? Because you, it seems like you were trying to adapt to the situation mm-hmm. and figure out where what what was going to pay you yeah. and what you could enjoy doing. So you were figuring out to be a writer as well and then acting and all this other uh, stuff as well? I mean, it was it was almost as though I didn't want to shut any door. Yeah. I, you and know what I'm saying? You have to. And, and it's funny because I remember the manager who I was interning for in 2008 and 2009 yeah. um, and who is still working today. He's incredibly successful. Mm-hmm. Um, he said to me, I remember his car was in the shop and he needed, and his uh, assistant wasn't able to drive, so I had to drive him <laughs> his car. Right. And it was super awkward. And um, But I remember him being like, all right, Clark, so what do you want to do? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, you know, I'm, I work, I'm a theater actor and I love comedy, but also, and he was like, let me tell you something. This whole jack of all trades thing, it doesn't work. If you're Tina Fey, maybe you can do it, but nobody else can do it. And at the time, yeah. he was not wrong. He was right at the time. He was right at the yeah, time. Everyone was telling but you But within mm-hmm. three years, yep. it was just like... Anyone can do anything right. anywhere. Um, for me, you know, I realized, and maybe maybe it was just because I, I feel like I've changed a lot as a person mm-hmm. over the last 10 years in mm-hmm. a good way, but mm-hmm. I think in terms of self-confidence as well. Right. And I was very afraid of, I wasn't afraid because I was here and I loved being here yeah. and I was determined, but also I was very much like, well, I'm not a model or I'm not this or I'm not that. So yeah. like, I don't know, like I'm not going to get a commercial agent and then book a guest spot on a TV show. And like, right. that's not going to be my path. I right. figured that out pretty quickly, you know, and, and I think that, Perhaps if I were a different person mm-hmm. 10 years ago, like maybe I could have, I would have felt differently, but yeah, I wasn't sure, a different sure. person. So, um, so it was just like, okay, keep working with my friends. We're doing sketches. Mm-hmm. We're doing shorts. We're doing all these things. I'm doing theater. I'm doing musicals where I can every now and again. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm booking like, I did like a really small little suave hair campaign that was print. <laughs> that was like, you know, it was yeah. so, but it was, it was that kind of stuff. But I, oh, and then it was a couple of years in, um, I started, so I, this woman who, who ended up being a mentor of mine, her name mm-hmm. is Kathy. She was a daytime talk producer oh, wow. and her daughter is an it was a working actress and still is a working actress and she was show running and executive producing a children's television show on the hub network which was hasbro's right. tv channel right so my best friend jason who's like a brother mm-hmm. to me was um writing and directing on her show so oh. she was looking for an assistant for her daughter her daughter was 17 at the okay. time and she was number one on the call sheet she was the lead on a on an abc family show wow and um really with it smart responsible okay. like amazing girl but also 17 right. barely 18 years right. old like let's send somebody to set with her yeah, yeah, essentially sure, sure. and so they brought me in and they treated me like family mm-hmm. and she really mentored me in terms of you know I had told her like oh yeah well I, I do this like student film festival and they come to LA once a year and they have me do their red carpets right and I and she was like oh well you know you could do this or you could do that I'll help you with the, making a reel like oh, wow. here's what people want to see I'll, and she like tried to put me in things on the hub and like that's great all that stuff and so 
I kind of realized I was getting more traction mm-hmm. in entertainment, whether it was news or carpets right. or whatever. Um, I think I told you this when we had lunch like a years ago, yeah. but, but I was getting more traction that way. And I was, and I was noticing that the digital landscape was changing yeah. and I was like, you know what? It's going to be a lot easier for me to get in a door if I people know who I am in some way right wha- rather than just being like no I am an actor and I don't do that <laughs> yeah. and so goodbye opportunities I will be over here like essentially swimming upstream right which is miserable yes. um, and some people do it that way and that's that's their they're tough and that's yeah. their deal but for me I was like no nah, let's use our resources let's see what's in front of us and take these opportunities mm-hmm. as they come and so that's when I started getting into more of the entertainment hosting right. and that whole deal. Well, it also makes sense for you because you'd already had the background from growing up uh, when you were younger about analysis yes. and commentary and film and so and, with, and politics. And all. So you were able to think on your feet in situations and also look at situations and offer a point of view and also as a woman, mm-hmm. like this whole idea. And we've seen this now uh, happening so much more nowadays. It All of a sudden, it seems like this Weinstein thing, like open the door mm-hmm. to make people be like, hey, maybe we've been fucking this up for a few decades yeah. now, yeah. and maybe we should take a step back and listen and hear. And it's been incredible. What's it been like for you? And I don't mean to jump and segue no, no, into this, fine. but what's it been like for you to watch this happen over the last few weeks? Like, it's been, for me as a man, it's been amazing to watch because it's so swift in a way that I'd heard stories, I'd seen stuff, mm-hmm. You all the Woody Allen stuff, you knew all about the yeah. stuff in the past, Roman Polanski... But you also knew that Hollywood would be like, well, we'll give you some time and then come back. But this feels very like you're done. It's over. Get out. And what's this? Has this surprised you? It's been overwhelming in a lot of ways. Okay. Um, The thing that I hope that your listeners, the first thing I want to say about all of this is because, you know, an acquaintance of mine said something on Facebook recently Mm -hmm. where he said like, pretty soon you're not going to be able to not hold a door open for someone in this town. And I, the thing that I want to make clear... I hate those reactions. It, and it's okay. Like, it's okay, but it's frustrating. It is, I'm sure. The thing that's important to make clear is it's not as simple as making an accusation and all of a sudden it's a knee-jerk reaction mm-hmm. and goodbye, Kevin Spacey. Right, right. It is journalists doing lots and lots of research. Yeah. You know, I speaking of Louis uh, about Louis CK, yeah. I recently read an article from the woman it was published in Vice, the woman who who actively tried to break this story about 2 years ago. Yes. And she said, "Guys, you have to understand at the time no one wanted to go on the record. Mm-hmm. So if we if we publish that, all we're publishing are rumors and yeah. no no media outlet will do that right. because they don't want lawsuits, right? right? So I know that like journalism is in our country is under attack right now, but the truth is all of these cases when you read these New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. we're talking 10, 20, 30 people who have the same story yep. over decades. And I will say like, you know, I had a situation when I first entered into the hosting world where uh, I was on a show and then all of a sudden I wasn't. And there was a lot oh. of um, mystery and intrigue as to why did Clark get fired? Why did, right. where did she go? What's happened? And you know, I didn't say anything. I kept my mouth shut because I didn't want it to be perceived as I was whining or it's her word against his or I'm a drama queen or whatever. And seeing all of this has been overwhelming because it's like I feel comfortable talking now and I feel comfortable about saying no. Like I was mistreated. I was bullied. I was intimidated. I stood up to it and I got fired. Yeah. And that is 100% what happened. And not fe- and feeling like, you know what? I, I have the confidence mm-hmm. and the wind at my back, essentially. And I think that's why. Not only with women. You're seeing yeah. men. You're seeing all these right. people come forward with mm-hmm. their stories. And I think, you know, this is not... The other thing that I want to say to the listeners is that this is not exclusive to entertainment. Right. I've seen a lot of tweets being like, Hollywood's such a sick place yeah, yeah. well guess what you know like you're gonna you see these stories in tech mm-hmm. you see them in finance oh, yeah. you see them you see them across the board mm-hmm. and so it's been but it's also been really upsetting because okay. you read these stories and you relive mm-hmm. all of your experiences of of these same or similar things well this is interesting too because i when trump was elected mm-hmm. it was 
so interesting to watch my female friends react in ways that were surprising to me because I'm like, yeah, it's, I hate that son of a bitch. It sucks. But like we've had Republicans, we've had like, but this was something else. He triggered something in a lot of women. Like there were breakdowns in mo- Like I had a friend who cried for two weeks, like every day straight because he came to symbolize the harassment and a sexual abuse and disregard and disrespect that women had felt for decades in their lives and coming off of Obama, mm-hmm. they had, it seemed like women had felt um, they were really embracing the power of them with some like Michelle yeah. Obama leading the way. And then someone like that to be voted in, yeah. it triggered these kinds of reactions there, that were so There's powerful. no, look, I mean like there's no. Perf- so you're seeing it now. I'm seeing it. Yeah. Connected. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It right. is connected. Right. It It is connected. Yeah. You know, I have talked to my, Friends who are women in this industry specifically, yeah. um, older, younger, powerful, not powerful. We have had private conversations where we've all been like, a, a dam has burst. Yeah, like pe- we are over this, yeah. and or but it was it was day one. It was like people woke up, and but it did feel, you know, no, no politician is perfect i think we know that um but for me one of the things that felt like a referendum on was like we knew we had seen how uh women's reproductive rights and women's health had been treated over the last however many years and for me healthcare is a really big issue Mm -hmm. it always has been and i've had personal issues with my own reproductive health and that happened young and you know and and a lot of women have and a lot of them don't talk about it but the thing it was for me it was just like when i had friends men or women who felt indifferent to 2016 i I remember being like, but you know what? I needed you. Yeah. My health care needed you right. because guess what's about to happen? The pre-existing condition of being a woman and having a having an abnormal pap smear and mm. they go, sorry, you can't be insured now. Right. And it turns out to be nothing, you know, or or mental health. And you go see a therapist. Oh, you can't be insured anymore. You have a pre-existing condition right. like I needed people to show up. And then do, I'm a, tr- trust me, I am a white lady. Like, I, I am. Trust the, her on this. She I, is absolutely a white I lady. I am a white lady. And so, like, there are people who have it, who, who were in more peril as a result of this yeah. than me. Yeah. But I, I felt it as a woman. LGBTQ people feel it, people right. of color. Like, this was all like, where were you guys? Yeah. Why did you not show up for us? We needed you. Yeah, and it's crazy because it was 54% white women that voted for oh, you. Oh, trust me. And that's amazing. It, it is. Wh- white ladies are. But, you know, I'm not going to make excuses. Right. I'm not going to make excuses. Um, I think there was a lot of things that happened at the right time to elect someone like that. And but it, yeah. in some weird way, it's also been a wake up call. And all this stuff we've seen been happening over the last year. Mm -hmm. He hasn't been able to win any of his stuff in the courts. He hasn't been able to pass anything legislative of any worth. But he is attacking where he can attack. He's deconstructing our system. And it's affecting women, people of color, LGBTQ, all across the board. And then you see the rise of this white supremacy stuff, the Nazism stuff. Like, it's it's a battle that we're having now, legitimately step by step every day. And you know, I'm from the South. Yeah, I have plenty of conservative friends. Yeah, me too. I'm from Virginia and, grew, and did very, Florida. Yeah, yeah. so I, like yeah, the absolutely. thing, if you're still listening, if you're still with us, <laughs> I'm sure they are. And you haven't and you haven't gone. I hate every minute of <laughs> no, this. No, they understand Why the outlaw they nation. They understand. Um, but but the thing is, conservatism is not the problem. No. Absolutely. You know not. what I'm saying? I have this conversation sure. a lot. And I have friends who are Republicans. They work on Republican campaigns. Yeah. They are in the political system and they are horrified. Yeah. And they did not support this. Right. They didn't support it now. They don't support it or they didn't support it then and they don't support it now. Yeah. And, you know, I think like the same friend who I'm very, he was my little brother in my fraternity and we're really close to each other. He just shared something recently about Roy Moore and basically being like, no, this isn't worth it. We're not going to stake all of our principles and our ideals on the capital R in exchange for a 32 year old man coercing a 14 year old child 
parental consent or not. Right. The, the weirdest, but whatever. <laughs> but, but you get what I mean? Like, so yeah. if you're still listening, I don't want you to think that I'm like, and another thing about, no, you no. know, but the conflating being conservative and uh, a white nationalist, I'm not willing to do that. Right. And I am a progressive Democrat and always mm-hmm. have been. Mm-hmm. But I hope that moderate and conservative people are are feeling this way too yeah. and i think we might have seen that in virginia yes uh, recently and new jersey and, new and Jer- a number of places exactly yeah. and it's so it, it isn't about there you know there are so many people in the media but and also in in real life who yes they get swept up in like the 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 ruckus of it all but there mm-hmm. are a lot of people who really do want to listen yeah who do want to engage but when it comes to like, I'm sorry, I am not down with Nazis. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like oh, I'm drawing a line in the sand. Yeah, Controversial right. <laughs> as it may be. No Nazis are pedophiles for me. Thank you very much. But we're, we're culturally seeing something, you know, mm-hmm. to bring it back to like the bigger question of, yeah. of the entertainment industry. We're culturally seeing a shift. It's, there's going to be a backlash to this. Uh, it's going to be hard mm-hmm. um, and it's going to happen. It's inevitable. A lot of shoes are about to drop. And also like, you know, I'm not going to sit here and lie. The Louis C.K. stuff, I have heard those rumors for years. Right. We all kind of know it. Yeah. But this one's hard for me. Okay. It's still hard. Why is that? Because I think he's a brilliant comedian. Yes. I think he's a very intelligent and emotional mm-hmm. person. Mm-hmm. I think he has been an advocate for women on stage, yeah. which is you know, I don't know. I'm not. I'm not making. It's rare s- to find in male comedians. It, it is, and yeah, I'm absolutely. not trying to make excuses or like mm-hmm. you know whatever. But like some of his, some of my favorite bits of his are about you know are very much about um, speaking up for and about women. Yeah. He has daughters and mm-hmm. and all of these things. It's so. What I'm trying to say is this is all a complicated thing. Yes. And it's this not is, simple. And this is why I like having you on the podcast to talk about this stuff, Clark, because you do approach things from a more complex place. Even when we're on like movie talk mm-hmm. together sometimes, you'll say stuff and, and, and even when like sometimes when you have a different opinion than mm-hmm. me, I, I go Oh fuck! I didn't think about it like that, and it's 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 fun for me because I'm an analytical guy, and I sure. enjoy doing that as well. And it's it's a format that only have an hour, and you have to spew and you jump topic to topic, yes. so you can't really get into it. But something like this on this show is what I like to talk about mm-hmm. because yes, the surface stuff, all of it terrible. Yes. Why? Let's yes. find out why. What are the ramifications? Molly Lambert did a fantastic article about Louis uh, yesterday on the or two days ago on the Ringer mm-hmm. and exploring about how he was cre- why this happened yeah. and why it took so long for it to come out when yeah. there had been rumors for years and then what the implications are to the comedy world now going forward yeah. because he was a man who spoke about how terrible men are to women. He talked. He was always talking about women in a supportive way. And then he then he would do these things to these other women, and then the apology comes out, and the apology is kind of clumsy because he never says I'm sorry, and then he says they admired me four times in the apology, which doesn't resonate as someone who's really understanding the situation is. But what you said is correct; it's more complex because he, you can't black and white this guy. There's a lot of gray, muddled area yeah. within him, and so what is? And, and it's fascinating to hear you say that. Like, it's 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 a difficult one for you. It is. It yeah. is hard for me. And I think the other thing I want I want the listeners or people who maybe aren't in entertainment but yeah. but are passionate about entertainment and follow it and like really care about it, you know, the power dynamic is what's important here. Right. So so and I'm not even, you know, power dynamic is a very uh, nebulous term, right? Sure. Like it could mean so many different it's things, yes. right? However, if you are an executive producer, or a director, yeah. and you are in charge of hiring people, you have power over them. Yeah. That is a workplace issue. And mm-hmm. that's the thing that I want people to understand. Kevin Spacey yeah. is an executive producer on House of Cards. Yep. So he is, he in theory has, not only does he have the power, the quote fingers power that comes along with being number one on the call sheet and yeah. an actor, right? Yeah. Because that, it does, whether it's fair or not, inherently has a lot of power that comes attached to it. He's an executive producer. So he has 
business power too. Brett Ratner yeah. has, is a producer and a director. He has cast it. He can say to these mm-hmm. women, do what I tell you to do or you won't, I won't cast you and I'll tell everybody else not to cast. Or, you know what Which I'm is saying. what had been happening. And that's exactly. So that's right. what I want people to understand is like, yeah. there. yes, there is a difference between being a jerk or being inappropriate or right. being whatever at a party or in general or all of these things. Right. But when you have... Hiring and firing power, mm-hmm. that that is where we're running into this issue. And that's yeah. where you have to say goodbye. Yeah. You don't get any more power anymore. Well, and I think that was so amazing with what happened to Louis because the apology came out. And normally, maybe even six months ago or three months ago, the apology comes out and, and we everybody brushes on the table because there's too much money involved in it and they move on. But this time, yeah. even with the apology, he lost Everything. Netflix, HBO. Manager, yeah. agent, oh, the whole nine. Yeah. Everything because of how he had been denying it for so many years and, and making fun of it and mm-hmm. saying it was rumors and I won't address it. People make up stuff because I'm famous. It came back so powerfully. Yeah. Same thing to Weinstein. Ratner is the only one who's trying to sue somebody for saying so, which is, a, I don't know why he thinks he can get away with that, but even Ratner now bleeds in with the news we have about Wonder Woman and Gal Gadot, and then also finding out, that, and I don't think a lot of people knew that Ratner and Rat Pack were involved in producing Justice, uh, Wonder Woman rather, and Justice League. And, uh, and, everything, and everything essentially at WB. Right. I mean, not everything literally, but right. pretty close. Yeah, yeah, pretty close. So now, and then Gal makes the stand now that she will not come back as Wonder Woman if Ratner is the exact now in in there's I don't know if Gal makes this stand before Wonder Woman comes out and this is what's so amazing is like okay you have the power you have the pulpit and she's using it in a way that's progressive and smart and intelligent and powerful yeah. and pushing back and this is what's happening now because finally there's a space that's been created to be heard and believed and listened to. And I was talking to Danny last night about this. And she, Danny Fernandez, she's been on the show before. She said, I'm happy because I was two or three years ahead of these. But I'm also embittered and frustrated that it took this long to get. And I was like, you're only 27. Like, women have been fighting for decades to get people to listen. So you say it overwhelms you or it hurt, like what you were saying earlier. Why is that for you? Why is it overwhelm or hurt you or now? Because truthfully, I mean, pretty much I would be willing to put money down that any woman in any space yeah. has stories like these. Yeah. It's not uncommon whether you're on the street and somebody comes up and I'm not talking, you know, a friend of mine posted on Facebook with regards to the Louis C.K. situation. He was sincerely asking, why does a why would you want to do what Louis did? Yeah. I don't understand. Right. Like why what do you what do you get out of that? And so many women were like, oh, and myself included. Mm-hmm. I was walking my dog and some dude in a car pulls up to me. I look over. He is masturbating. I make eye contact you had with this, him. This is your me. experience. This is me. Wow. This happened to me. Jesus. And, and that's on the street. Yeah. Forget about the fact that three years ago I got fired for standing up to somebody mm-hmm. for being a bully. Right. So – whether it's personally or professionally, we all have these stories. Yeah. They have, we have become adjusted to them, mm-hmm. which, you know, everybody's got to do their own thing and like right. move on with their lives and in some ways. And you adjust. When I say move on with their lives, I mean you have to continue living. Yes. Right. And I'm not saying forget. I'm just saying you have to process it and move on. Because you, if we didn't, yeah. we would never right. leave the house. Yeah. <laughs> you have to not let it break you. Right. Right. And that's the thing that, I think men have to do a better job of understanding. And me too. Like, it's been amazing to talk to women over the last decade and kind of see my own patterns of how I was approaching dating, how I was approaching talking to women. I mean, I was never looking like Ratner or anything, those guys, but it was more a matter of like, you're trying to seduce and you're trying, and you like, you pursue and you see in the movies, well, the guy, the persistent guy gets the girl, right? You think these are the, the, and this is what's changing. Like now I'm in this weird place for the last two years of like completely changing how I approach courting and dating because I'm more, I'm less about, I'm going to get my way or I'm going to get her and more about how, what is my process here from where it was before? What is my thought? Okay, she has said this. What is the truth? What does it, what it mean? Do I take her to word or do I? Look? So there's all these things. So it's it's interesting for me as an analytical person to now look at all this stuff and, and explore it. And I, I, what I worry about is what you're talking about is this backlash. Because it's already, I can see it already starting to build on the internet mm-hmm. and online that people are like, 
you know, why do they all get to make these accusations and they're all true? You know, why do we get us into proven guilty? That kind of bullshit that drives me nuts because you're right. I think if these guys took a a moment and opened their ears and opened their minds and sat down with ten of ten, five, five women that they know very well and asked them, tell me your worst stories about dealing with men, things of that nature. And what you just talked about, having a guy drive up. Dudes don't have that experience. No. Guys don't have that experience, no. right? And that's something that we have to do better at understanding and hearing. Because, uh, like, one of the goals I want to have at Nation at some point down the road is to have, a, a, like, a, a, a round table mm-hmm. with three or four women and just sit around and talk and hear the stories. Like, for two hours, hear the stories. Because I want my male listeners to hear this. And other women who are listening go feel, feel a kinship and understand. That even people in power, uh, positions of, of notoriety and success to a degree that you have, Clark, experience this absolutely and i think look i just don't want these guys the 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 gentlemen in the audience who who are like yourself who are trying to process yeah and understand i don't want them to feel attacked yes. right um but at the same time they're they're you know it makes people uncomfortable to see women angry yeah um and and anger is the right word yeah. Um, you know, I made this comment on, on I shared the video of Uma Thurman when she was asked. My God. And the, and, the, and what was amazing to me was I saw so many people sharing it mm. and they were sharing it with comments like hell hath no fury and mm. don't make her mad. And I was like, no, no, no. This is how we all feel. Right. We all the look on her face. We have because we have been saying this. For so long. Right. And it's just like, we do, sometimes, yes, like, yeah. I feel like Uma Thurman. You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, and, and she yeah. is me and I am her. But the point is, listening and, but also what you said, thinking. Yeah. Just thinking to yourself, like, mm-hmm. huh, now that's interesting. Not even, even if you don't want to go down the path of like, why did why is that wrong? Why did I do it? Yeah. Why is that my natural right. why would this elicit that reaction? I never thought of that. And that is all I think this really needs to do. The big swings of of firing Harvey Weinstein yeah, yeah, or yeah. removing Brett Ratner or whatever. Like that's important. Yes, sure. that is really important. Right. But for everybody who cares about this, you know, it's gonna make you uncomfortable. It's going to make all of us uncomfortable. Mm. We've been in a state of discomfort for a long time <laughs> as, a, as the United States. Yeah. And, um, but like sitting in that discomfort, I will, let me give an example. Real superficial, easy. I saw Get Out when I went and saw Get Out. Yeah. And, and, and okay, spoilers for Get Out. Yeah. So spoiler alert, <laughs> you've been warned. Rose is evil. Okay. Rose is in on it. And so I, I was like, oh no. And then, so the movie happens. I love the movie. Of course I went to the screening by myself. I was walking out and I was thinking to myself and I was like, oh man, I really didn't want her to be bad too. (laughs) That just makes me feel real bad. And then I went, you know what, Clark, (laughs) as a white lady, maybe it's okay for you to feel bad for a second. Mm -hmm. And it was like, yeah, I can sit in this discomfort and go, yeah, okay. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. that is a very superficial example, but it is it is a moment of realizing this makes me uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah, and that's what I've been experiencing as I hear the stories and read the stories in these articles and read the stories that women are putting on Twitter about their experiences, and I go, oh, Okay. I understand that now. I didn't see that before. That's interesting. And I sit in the uncomfortable nature and go, okay, okay. And that's all right too because you're learning. Totally. And I think that's what I hope happens from all of this is that we have a deeper, more philosophical discussion that changes the gender dynamics and approach yeah. to the entire situation. Now, it doesn't mean that we're, we're – I'm not talking about it like in a Pollyanna kind of way that we're all just going to figure this out yeah. and hold hands in kumbaya. No, this is a complex issue. But there has to be a baseline, a foundation. And from the foundation, then you can use that as a as a way of assessing the situations mm-hmm. or the case guy – Case by case basis as they come along, you yes. know, and that's and that's the thing. And some people are like, well, some people lie or some people don't, oh, they're like self-serving or whatever. And I'm just like, 
this is not the thing we're talking about. 30 people all. don't get together yeah. and coordinate. You know what I mean? Right. Like, and, that's and, not. And the thing with the New York Times article is that they didn't read the New York Times article, then call them up and go, hey, I had this exact same experience. Yeah. The, what you were saying earlier, the reporters are sourcing this stuff. They're talking to them and they're seeing the similarities and experiences. Yeah. And HR, by the way, like if you're even talking about a corporate interest, yeah. human, human resources are not allowed to just fire someone based on a. You know what I'm Accusation, saying? Like, right. That's not how it goes. And yeah. oftentimes what you find are people coming forward with corroborated mm-hmm. stories and and they're not doing anything. That's right. that's where you get into this, uh, you know, Andy Signore situation. Right. So right. it's like... It's, Which is alleged. Wait, yeah, alleged. I don't want to get Yes, story. alleged, <laughs> alleged situation. I don't want to get um, But so, yeah, it's... Um, I just I just would encourage people, myself included, mm-hmm. to listen, to process, mm-hmm. to... And, and to just, if you're uncomfortable, it's like, okay, I'm uncomfortable, but... Can I withstand this? Yes, I can. Yeah. And now what am I going to do about it? What am I going to think about it? Mm-hmm. Et cetera. What do you hope to see happen from all of this? Like, have you thought about that at all? Like, is there something that, like, as you're seeing this happen and the surprising way that it's happening, what do you hope comes out of it? Well, so here's, so, like, a great example of what can happen. What, like, what's the, so aside from the icky part, right, mm-hmm. of the of the um, harassment or, or assault or or the physical sure. act, which sure. makes us feel icky, the business side. Mm-hmm. So um, the Louis C.K. example is these comedians who are women, yeah. they're not getting the same opportunities. They're not getting meetings mm-hmm. at this certain company as a result of being t- directly tied to um, and talking about, yeah. whether, even if it wasn't publicly on the record, telling their story yeah. so so you're maybe potentially not getting the next broad city the next inside amy schumer right. and that's what i want so and that's just using the comedy example mm-hmm. right or, or you know but i hope that the the my point is clear that i hope that women that that it is going to be more inclusive mm-hmm. um gender lgbt um you know people of color across the board right. like Hopefully cleaning house for some of these people who have been tyrants, um, regardless of their profession or their industry, will make way for qualified individuals Mm -hmm. who might bring a different point of view, a different perspective. And with entertainment, that's so important. You don't get get out. If you don't give a black direct right. writer director his first shot, right, and, and yeah, create the space for him to explore uh, racial relations, That's exactly right, in a way that is powerfully subtle yep. yet incredibly overt. Absolutely, it's the incredible line that he walked in that film. Yes. I rewatched it again a couple of weeks ago, and I'm amazed that a studio let him get away with it. Absolutely, you but know, like as a that... person of color, watching for years how they've done how they've handled the dangerous minds type of approach to issues with color it was great to see something be that gutsy yeah you know i agree and and authentic and weird and cool um but so that's 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 an example like we need to make space for um an amy schumer or Mm -hmm. uh you know or jordan peele or take your pick you get what i'm saying but we need to bring more um more different voices to the table and Mm -hmm. that's what i hope that there's room and space for for inclusion yeah uh, do you see? Do you? Uh, what have you heard? Like, what have? You, what has been the reaction of your fellow female journalists? Uh, like, I've heard. I've heard things in the wind of like you all have a text chain that only all of you are on. Like, some women have this yeah. that they have a text chain where oh, they, only their uh, friends are on it and they talk about their experiences. They talk about all these kinds. Do you have that as well? Like in your world? Yeah, I mean, I've been having a lot of conversations with a lot. Like, you know, when. When, when it specifically with respect to the digital space, mm. um, you know, I got a lot of phone calls that weekend, oh, wow. um, and uh, from men and women, mm. and um, had a lot of conversations, some uncomfortable, some uplifting, yeah. um, and uh, you know, I. I yeah so so people are and we're we're all talking about it more I think mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of women are talking about it more um and uh you know I'm having conversations with more men about it too yeah. so yeah. that to me has been like but but yeah it's it's definitely a groundswell yeah um and and the thing about the levy breaking is that like I sincerely feel like I said earlier in our conversation mm-hmm. more comfortable telling the truth yeah uh, because there's less 
the the person or people who may be able to punish me or r- retaliate against me yeah. well now people are listening to me yeah. like you know I, the, the it's such a great example i shared this on social media and i really meant it like when I had this situation happen a few years ago where I was fired, I was immediately replaced. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the idea is if you step out of line or you make somebody mad, yeah. you are replaceable. You are disposable. You do not matter, right? right. Seeing Kevin Spacey cut out of a feature film that's coming out in less than a month, mm-hmm. I'm not trying to... I'm not making apologies for Kevin Spacey. I'm not trying to pick on him, but I want to use that example because it is literally him being replaced. It's everything that we have been afraid of for so long. And it happened to me. I was fired, no explanation, replaced the next day. You are disposable. You mean nothing. To see it happen to an Academy Award winning, Emmy Award winning Hollywood. Yeah powerhouse was like holy shit yeah like this is legit Mm -hmm. this is real it's pretty remarkable (laughs) (laughs) have you had a conversation with your mom about this This, because your mom as you said at the beginning of the podcast she's very politically active she's always been into the call into the causes like do what has been the conversation with her that's an interesting question i haven't had this conversation with my mom or my dad really um but i have been talking a lot about it with my boyfriend okay and he is uh an independent movie producer and he has worked in the uh the corporate space and the studio space, but now, and he's like, nah, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm out on my own. He's from the Midwest. And I think he is like me. We are not conservative, but we are traditional. Right. And anybody who knows anything about me knows that I am also, I may be traditional, but I also uh, push certain boundaries. Sure. <laughs> um, and, and so having these conversations with him yeah. has been, really amazing. Okay. Um, and it's not, by the way, it's a dialogue. It's like, it's like you and I right, right, right now. Right. It's not like me being like, well, let me tell you something and him <laughs> sitting there being like, okay, yes, just yell at me for 30 minutes. But we have spirited back and forth yeah. and have been since, since all of this broke. Yeah. And as two people, you know, I work in front of the camera and behind the camera. Mm-hmm. He works exclusively behind the camera, but supports, you know, friends of his who are actresses. He, you know, he is a pr- former college professor. So he has students coming to him for it. He has that power dynamic. Right. So having these back and forths and really interesting, complicated conversations with him yeah. has been really interesting. Wow. Well, and that's I'm great. lucky for it. Yeah. I'm lucky to be able to have those conversations. It, they're important. They're important because they, they make you think, they give you other perspectives and they enrich your opinion or your approach to yes. it when it happens again. And also, you, you know, know, personalizing it, like yeah. to go back to even, even politics, you know, the, the, the quote fingers politics, mm-hmm. right. And mm-hmm. this like toxic dynamic that is happening in our country right now <laughs> right. where people are very tribal and on one side or the other, you know, talking to a person that you truly care about and, and know who they are and that they are compassionate yeah. and they are kind, but They are capable of having thoughts where you're like, and beliefs where you're like, whoa. Yeah. And so it then in return, I have to go, okay, I understand. Let's, here's how I can explain it. Or here's, but that dialogue of going, I don't write you off. I don't because you, because you don't know, or it hasn't been your experience or you don't choose to know because I, I care about you and I know how truly wonderful and kind you are. So that type of conversation is the conversation that all of us really need to be having right now. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and go, Oh, you're dead to me. Goodbye. (laughs) You're not perfect. Goodbye. It's like, okay, how can I, talk about this with you to where we both understand where the other one is coming from. Right. And that's important. That's, what, that's where the two sides have, the two things have to occur, right? Mm-hmm. You have to be willing to hear the other side yes. of it, but then the other side of it has to be willing to hear your that's side right. of it as well. And so you create the space for both people to hear both sides and find some kind of commonality mm-hmm. in that, you know, and learn from each other, which yeah. is uh, super important as this gets 
further and further because I, I really don't know what's next. You, I, I, it's so funny because we used to open Twitter waiting for what the next stupid thing Trump was going to do. Now it's you open Twitter going like, okay, who is it today? Mm-hmm. Like that person from Flash on the CW. That yeah, was Kreisberg. really, That's yeah, Greg, Greg Kreisberg. That was really surprising. Um, and I'm sure we know a couple of friends or a few friends who have other people who they think it's going to drop at any moment. Mm-hmm. The Louis thing had been going around for a couple of weeks yeah, before it finally totally. dropped. So people are waiting on that. So it's just an interesting time to be in the industry yeah. now. Cause I wonder, and I was talking to Draco about this as a follow up the other day. And he was like, I wonder what's going to happen to if, like if it starts to become a groundswell of these other exec, like what's are there going to be vacuums of power at these studios or at these networks, and who's going to step into those vacuums of power? And also, just by removing, uh, that's not enough. We mm-hmm. also have to destroy the culture it's of systematic. Yes, yeah. of systematic of, of supporting right. and looking the other way, yep. and like that had been going on for years. Like, yeah. do those people get moved out now? Like, what is the thing? So I, I think there's so much more to say and there's so much more that's going to happen before we level out yep. this feels like a tsunami it's gonna and, go on for a while yeah. and also like a like a force of nature yeah there's an aftermath right there's cleanup yes you know the storm is done right but now literally and figuratively you have to pick up the pieces right right and you have to put it back together yeah because we because you can if people like you were saying earlier like holly weird or whatever they say whatever the quotes is but it's movies are important just like what you were saying Absolutely. way at the beginning of this of this pod movies are important to uh kind of make you think to get you to explore to get you to look at things in a certain way and i think Without movies, I I sometimes wonder what our society would be like without that kind of media to show us. Storytelling, absolutely, exactly. Is, From is caveman tale days. Old as yeah. Old. exactly. Yeah, exactly. And art, same right. tale as old. Yeah, for right. sure. Is there? Do you have a, now to kind of just a second? So we ended a little more positive. Hey, yeah. Do you have? Is there a movie you're looking forward to that you haven't seen yet that's coming out? So like, is there something you're super excited about? The Disaster Artist. <laughs> <laughs> when, God, I am so excited for that when, movie. I, have you seen The Room? Did yes. You, okay. I just saw it for the first time. Okay. Did was, you see it in a theater or did you just rent it? In a theater. Okay. Yeah. Right. And um, I'm really excited for The Disaster Artist because I really and truly love Seth Rogen. Yeah. Uh, I like that team. Yeah. Um, and I mean this sincerely. I feel like those guys really try and make movies that are heartfelt. Yeah. Even if they're raunchy, even if they are <laughs> crazy, yeah. um, they, there's always heart. Mm-hmm. And um, and they're not afraid to get weird. They're not afraid to get dark. They're not afraid to get sad. Yeah. But they're also not afraid to get emotional. Mm-hmm. And um, so I don't, I, and I've heard this about the movie from people who have seen it, that it's not making fun of this process. Right, it's right. celebrating the idea that a guy had a dream and he was determined to do it and yeah. he was determined to do it with his friends and he made something happen yeah. and it lives on to this day. <laughs> and I think that that's actually really cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And from a nerdy perspective, it's like, oh my God, the making of the room and like the, the legacy yeah. of this and, and all that. So like, I think I, this movie just has like Clark written all over it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really excited for that one. And is there, is there, is there a horror that's coming that you are excited Ooh, about? Because Of course, because we haven't mentioned it yet, but people, obviously Collider Nightmares, people were very uh-huh. big fans of the show. People were addicted to the show. I know that for a while. I know maybe it didn't hit the views to keep it going, but like people love the show. There are there's a very strong fan base. So yeah, is I'm there really something... proud of it and, yeah. and the weirdness, that weird little thing, yeah. that weird little show, Collider Nightmares. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I am endlessly curious about the Suspiria remake. Okay. Um, that is, is due out next year. Right. Um, I think I I really can't wait for that. I'm very curious about Danny McBride and David Gordon Green doing Halloween. This is the one that I put a pin in, and I'm like. Okay. I, lo- I love this because those yeah. guys are true horror nerds. Gotcha. They are they are all in. In fact, David Gordon Green is the executive producer of Suspiria because oh, okay. he tried to direct it for a decade right. and then finally moved off of the project, but I think he's still attached as an EP. Mm-hmm. McBride has told stories about his for all the scripts he wrote when he first came out here were horror movies and <laughs> and ghost stories and like you know I I McBride is another one who I think and David Gordon Green and Jody Hill those guys not not Jonah Hill Jody Hill right. um those guys Eastbound and Down Vice Principals like those guys make really honest yeah 
stuff. Mm-hmm. And those guys are far more thoughtful than anyone gives them credit for. Okay. Um, but that being said, Halloween, I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, so I'm very curious about that. You okay. know, there's... Um, and then uh, Jordan Peele, as we spoke of earlier, working right. on Lovecraft Country, which yeah. is a book I'm reading right now that I really enjoy with Misha Green from Underground okay. for HBO. That, I'm like, what? I've got to see that. So there's a lot of really cool stuff coming down the line. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's always a handful of independent films that come out of nowhere. Right. And you're just like, wow, this is so <laughs> cool. So, um, but yeah, The Disaster Artist is like my number one like okay. regular movie. <laughs> and then uh, I'm really curious about the Sp- Suspiria remake. I'm supposed to go to a premiere of it tonight. A disaster artist? Yeah, over at the Chinese. Nice. So, or the G, uh, whatever it is now, TLT Chinese Theater. I yes. do TLT somewhere instead yes. of Grauman's. But yeah, I was going to pull out of it, but okay. but I think you just talked me into going. Uh, good, so you I'm should. Go. Go, for, go, in my, go for me. <laughs> you, you'll go there and be like, I'm here for Clark. You I'm just here tell to her about how good it is. To enjoy exactly. this thing. Uh, all right, well, Clark, uh, we're rounding out down to, uh, the, out of time. So um, will you tell people, like, where can they find your work? Where can they see you? Yeah. Like, just wherever it is, just please feel free to talk about it. Well, and thank you for having me oh, on welcome. the show. Thank you for and, coming on. Um, so I am going to be launching a podcast. Um, oh, great. I want to say it's so uh, my goal last week of November, I've already banked up a episodes with um, Sam Levine and uh, Rebecca McKendry from Blumhouse oh, and nice. Scott Mance and Mary Jedikin. I'm recording with Mark Bernardin next week. Nice. I hope you will come on. I would love uh, to. But on. it is a movie uh, podcast called Sending the Wolf. Ooh. And um, so I'm really excited about Wait, it. Wait, Send in the Wolf? Sending. Sending the Wolf. Okay. So it's like Pulp Fiction. Oh, great. He's sending the wolf. <laughs> That's all you got to say. Um, so uh, I'm really proud of this. And, um, you know, I've got uh, ClarkWolf.com is up. So you you can actually put your email in there if you want, okay. um, but it's going to launch. I'm saying it publicly. I'm giving it a date <laughs> so that it'll happen because, gosh, I've been kicking the can for like six weeks now. But last week of November, Tuesday, so whatever that Tuesday is in November. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's coming. I'm really excited Where about Where is it. that going to be? What network so is it going to be So it'll be, on? it's going to be self-produced. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, to start. Love it. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to find it not only at ClarkWolf.com, mm-hmm. but you'll be able to find it um, on iTunes as well. Great. And um, you can find me always at ClarkWolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And now, what are the outlets you work for that you can find your work on oh, as well? Oh, yeah. So, um, well, you can find me on Collider Video. Obviously, doing the movie um, talks, And uh, you can find me on Nerdist.com, ComicBook.com, Skybound, which is Robert Kirkman's company. Oh, yeah. um, and I think that might be all for now. What's your anchor stuff? Do you do anchor stuff still? Or Stardust. Stardust. Oh, do you Stardust. do Stardust? Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not currently doing okay. any more right there. Okay. Um, but, my, but all the stuff that I did previously is up there, and okay. it's just Clark Wolf. You can find me there. Uh, yeah, like lots of it coverage and Halloween mm-hmm. stuff and scary movies on there. That's awesome. uh, yeah, so I'm I'm not hard to find. <laughs> no, she's Google not. me and I'm there. <laughs> but sending the wolf is the big one. That's something that I'm really excited about. All right. Well, then we encourage everyone listening to us go and uh, download that podcast when it comes out uh, at the end of November. Yes. As she said, yes. Tuesday. In November. Yes, so it's happening. It's going to happen. So, Clark, <laughs> thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And you're welcome. And this has been awesome. Yeah. Like I, I was really happy to get into these conversations because I want Outlaw Nation to be not just talking about movies. I wanted it. And Christian was very good about that when I pitched the show to him I was like I want to talk about whatever I want to talk about because I don't just have interest in smaller yeah. things I have interest in all kinds of things so having guests like you to come on and give your time to talk about these topics means a lot so thank you so much always thank you All right. well thanks everybody for listening to Outlaw Nation uh, please patronize all the other shows on SK Plus Podcast channel Don't Be a Beardo uh, The Wanger Show My Top 10 Show with Matt Nost uh, The Meaning of the new one with Ace and RB3 uh, and I forget oh Schmo I'm after Schmo as well so all patronize all those shows leave them comments and give them some love and uh, we will talk to you all next time on the Outlaw Nation <laughs>